functioning, the pressure must stay sealed inside. But this raises another question. What happens when the pressure in a closed system rises higher than the system can stand? Well, if the walls of the system are flexible, the increasing pressure will bulge them outward farther and farther. If pressure continues to increase, though, bulging the walls beyond their limit, the system will rupture. And the rupture will occur at the weakest point in the system, the same way that a chain will break at its weakest link. To protect systems from damage caused by excessive pressure, designers and engineers look for a way to relieve excess pressure automatically and safely. The simplest design they came up with was the rupture disc. A rupture disc is a sheet of metal or other material designed to rupture at a predetermined pressure. If this disc is to be used on a system under vacuum, that is, a system whose internal pressure is below atmospheric pressure, then there's nothing to hold it in place or prevent atmospheric pressure from pushing the disc into the system. So, we use a support device to keep the rupture disc bulging outward. The disc and support fit into a holder. which is bolted in place between two flanges. There are some discs that have a support device built onto them. This system must remain below atmospheric pressure. Whenever pressure rises above atmospheric pressure, the disc ruptures, relieving excess pressure and protecting the system from damage. This is another type of rupture disc called a rebuckling disc. It consists of a disc and a frame with a sharp knife point. A rebuckling disc is installed with the bulge extended into the system and the knife point on the outside. When pressure rises above what is normal for the system, it pushes the bulge outward. When the bulge meets the knife edge, it bursts, relieving the excess pressure. No matter what type of rupture disc is used, the principle is the same. The disc forms a weak spot in the system, saving other parts of the system from pressure damage. And if a rupture disc is placed well away from heavily traveled areas and normal work areas, it also relieves excess pressure safely, away from workers and other equipment. If a rupture disc must be used where workers normally are, it can be connected to discharge piping, which will safely carry the pressurized fluid away when the disc ruptures. Like other devices, rupture discs have both advantages and disadvantages. Among the advantages are that they're simple, lightweight, and very fast opening. In addition, they're relatively inexpensive and require no maintenance except an occasional check to be certain they're not leaking around the edges. They're also manufactured in a wide range of sizes and pressure ratings, from very small discs designed to rupture at pressures as high as 200,000 PSI to very large discs, such as the one on this turbine exhaust hood designed to rupture at only a few PSI. As a general rule, the larger the disc, the lower its pressure rating. The biggest disadvantage of ruptured discs is that when one ruptures, it has to be replaced. And to replace it, the system must be shut down. Downtime is costly. So rupture discs are usually limited to use on systems where problems with excessive pressure are very unlikely. When you do replace a rupture disc, there are certain things to be very careful of. Make sure, for example, that the replacement disc has the same pressure rating as the original. Replace a 205 PSI disc with a 590 PSI disc and the new disc won't rupture until long after excessive pressure has damaged the system. Replace a 205 PSI disc with one rated at 100 PSI, and you'll have the opposite problem. The disc will burst at normal system pressure. If the original disc required a support device, be certain to install a support device with the replacement. Because if you don't, and you forget the support, the disc is likely to collapse inward and rupture long before it's supposed to. To avoid common installation mistakes, always consult the manufacturer's instruction manual before beginning. Knowing what to do before trying to do it saves everybody time, effort, 
and money. We've learned what pressure is and what it can do when it gets out of hand. We've looked at the most simple type of pressure relief device, the rupture disc. We've seen that although a rupture disc is effective, fairly inexpensive, and requires only minimal maintenance, it has one major drawback. When a disc does burst, the system usually has to be shut down to replace it. This disadvantage of rupture discs sent designers back to their drawing boards to find more adjustable as well. That too adds complications to the design. This pressure relief device meets both requirements. It closes after relieving excess pressure, and it can be adjusted as necessary to maintain a very accurate set point. It's called a relief valve, and it's used primarily on systems that handle pressurized liquids. To understand how a typical relief valve works, let's start with its basic parts. The outer shell is called the valve body or valve casing. It gives overpressurized liquids a path to flow through as well as holding the internal parts of the valve in their proper position. A look inside the valve body shows the inlet and the outlet. On this particular valve, the inlet and outlet are both threaded. The threads enable the inlet to be connected to the system and the outlet to be connected to discharge piping. In many high pressure applications though, the inlet might be flanged or even welded directly to the system the valve is protecting. When system pressure is normal, the path from the inlet to the outlet is blocked by the disc, also called the plug. Liquid is prevented from leaking around the disc by firm, even contact between the disc and a seat. In some valves, the seat is a permanent part of the valve body. In others, a threaded seat bushing is used. Because it's threaded, a seat bushing can be replaced if necessary. Guiding the up and down motion of the disc is the spindle or stem. Often, it too is threaded so it can be screwed directly into the disc. To hold the disc in place against normal system pressure, a spring is used. A spring washer forms a flat surface on top of the spring to ensure even contact between the spring and the adjusting screw. The adjusting screw fits down over the end of the spindle and screws into the valve body. This screw exerts downward force on the washer and spring and can be used to adjust the tension of the spring. A lock nut holds the adjusting screw in position once it's been set, and a cap covers the top of the assembly, protecting the internal parts from dirt and damage. That gives us the basic parts of a relief valve. Now, let's see how a relief valve works. Let's assume that normal system pressure for the system this valve is protecting is 18 psi and that the valve is set to open at a pressure of 20 psi. When system pressure reaches 19 psi, nothing happens. Pressure is still at a safe level. At 20 psi, though, the system pressure pushing upward on the disc begins to overcome the tension in the spring. The disc begins to lift off its seat, releasing pressurized liquid through the outlet. At 21 psi, the pressure lifts the disc even higher, and as pressure increases, the disc continues to lift until it has risen as far as it will go. This particular valve reaches its fully open position when system pressure reaches 25 psi. The difference between the pressure at which the valve begins to lift 20 psi and the pressure at which the valve is fully open, 25 psi, is called the accumulation of the valve. We say then that this relief valve has an accumulation of 5 psi. Another term you should know is lift or travel. Lift or travel is the distance the disc moves from its closed to its fully open position. In this valve, the lift is about 1 inch. In other relief valves, Lift ranges from fractions of an inch 
to several inches. The valve has done its job. It's relieved excess system pressure. Now, let's watch what happens as system pressure returns to normal. As pressure decreases, the upward force on the disc decreases. Thus, the tension in the spring gradually gains the advantage again and moves the disc back down toward its seat. At 20 PSI, the pressure at which the valve began to lift, spring tension and system pressure are equal. The disc is reseated. When pressure drops further, spring tension completely overcomes system pressure, firmly holding the valve closed. You can see how important proper spring tension is to the function of a relief valve. But, like any other component, springs wear after extended service, losing some of their stiffness. This changes the opening and closing point of the valve. To correct this, the spring adjusting screw can be tightened. This increases tension on the disc and raises the opening pressure of the valve. Loosening the adjusting screw has the opposite effect. It reduces the amount of tension on the disc, allowing the valve to open at a lower pressure. Remember, though, that each relief valve is designed to handle a certain range of pressures, so each can only be adjusted so much. So, before making any adjustment to any relief valve, consult the manufacturer's instruction manual. Know exactly what you're doing before you do it. I mentioned earlier that relief valves are used primarily on systems that handle pressurized liquids like cooling water, lube oil, and fuel oil. For gas and vapor systems, you'd normally use another type of